Hello and welcome to the Anyone Can Play Guitar podcast, which gives you, the listener, a series of hints and pointers on your journey as a musical artist, providing you with interviews from those in the music industry, along with our own experiences. Ben and James shine some light on the many pitfalls and opportunities that being a musician has to offer. Last week we spoke to comedian, musician and actor Nick Helm, where we covered songwriting for TV shows, cramming detail into short songs, and how to start the songwriting process. This week, Ben is up in Edinburgh speaking to Mike Livesley, aka Made by Mike, about his fascination with guitar pedals, building them, and why musicians want to use them. Welcome to episode 18, with me, James, and him, Ben. Where are we this week, James? Or where am I this week? Where are you? You are in Edinburgh. Yeah, on Rose Street. Mm. At the Milnes. Was it pub. windy? It wasn't windy this time. Well, it might have been outside, but we're indoors this time. We found a nice downstairs bar, which had minimal patrons until some ladies who were shopping sh- who came in after their shopping. But so it is worth mentioning. There's a little bit of background noise, but I wouldn't say it's um, as distracting as the wind. You in wouldn't. A, of course, I wouldn't. But um. I was a nice atmosphere. It got busier towards the end, but that'll be in part two because this one is a, is a doubler. <laughs> <laughs> you love your doubles. Everyone loves a double. So, who were with? Who were we talking to this week, James? We were with Mikey Pedals. Mikey Pedals, <laughs> made, made by, by Mike. Mike. Yes. So there's a bit of a backstory to this, isn't there? So Mike there got in touch on Twitter after listening to the Ross Millard episode. He yes. built a pedal for Ross, got in touch, said, hey, much you like the podcast? I'd like to do an episode. It was originally going to be via... Well, I, I suggested to him, <laughs> um, he was just getting in... Well, he, he wasn't so much getting in touch as opposed to just tweeting, saying, listening to the, to the show, out, ah, thanks yeah. for, the, ah, yeah, uh, right, thanks right. for the shout out, Ross, you know, really grateful type thing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, hold the phone. If there's one thing Ben wish he had known back in the day, <laughs> would have been how to buy pedals more effectively. If there's one thing I wish Ben had known <laughs> back in the day, it would have been how to uh, buy pedals effectively. Mm-hmm. Well, not just buy them. <clears throat> Use them, operate them. Don't get me wrong. In fairness, eventually you, you you got the hang of these things. Yeah. But there was a lot of noise my ears had to wear. <laughs> a lot of ambience at one point. <laughs> I'm not sure ambience is the word I'd choose. Okay, I can agree with that. <laughs> so yes, so if you haven't guessed by now, we're in Edinburgh talking to Made by Mike Pedals about guitar pedals. That's not his actual name. Mm, no, should it's not. Caveat. Yeah, <laughs> it should carry that. That. But that's his brand. Uh, yeah, that's his brand, yes. And we'll put details in the show notes for all that sort of stuff later. I'm, I'm sure we'll mention that later as well. But yes, this is an interesting conversation, whether you're a guitarist or not, about pedals and the things they can do. You might think, oh, pedals. I, I don't know, Ben. I think most people who are in bands or musicians probably go, ooh, pedals. Yeah, 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 possibly. If you talk to random Joe on the street, they're probably going, what? What? what, 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 what? I, I think in general, I, look, they're... <laughs> They're so, well, fundamental to a lot of acts. Mm-hmm. You know, and we talk about bands that don't use them as well. It's yeah, not... which is equally valid. It's not like you need guitar pedals. It's not a necessity. However, they are used en masse by many an artist. They can and beef up your sound. Therefore, warrant a bit of discussion. They do. So it's it's not exclusively about pedals. We'll get to know Mike a bit at the start about how he got into music, early bands, where he's from, the scene or lack of, in Redden, besides that one weekend in August that um, comes around. It's the massive festival. So, yeah, should we just get straight into it? Let's get right into it. Yeah, let's put that delay pedal on and get some reverb going on. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I could bring the delay pedal and we could start like recording oh, some stuff through no. it. <laughs> I'm sure people will love it. I can still hear it now. Hi, welcome to the podcast, Mike. Made made by Mike, as I know you, <laughs> Mike, yeah. Mike 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 Livesley here in Edinburgh, um, and I just we how did we get in touch again? Well, I think it was that um, I happened to listen to your podcast anyway, and I was listening to your episode with Ross, and uh, he mentioned actually that uh, they used a couple of pedals I built him, and mm. uh, yeah, well, it kind of made my day really. So I was <laughs> just uh, thought I'd get in touch with you both to say thanks for uh, 
for mentioning me and uh, to let you know that I was sort of listening and enjoying it. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of how we got in touch, really, yeah. and sort of serendipitous that you happened to be coming up my way quite shortly afterwards. So Yeah, it, yeah that is always nice when that happens. Oh, yeah. um, so, how, like, how do you know Ross? How did you get involved with Ross or the Future Heads or anyone particularly? Well, that matter? to be honest, the way I got in touch with Ross was um, that he, he came to me because... He heard my name from um, Mick, who used to play guitar in um, Frankie and the Heartstrings before oh, yeah. he joined. And I built pedals for Mick a few times in the past. He's a really nice chap. And a lot of this sort of pedal stuff has come organically, which I'm sure become clearer as we talk about it a bit more. But um, yeah, it's just kind of been through vi- very much like sort of a series of happy coincidences that, you know, I was, I've always been like a big fan of, of the Future Heads and, and the other stuff that Ross has been involved with. And I used to go and see him all the time down in London when I lived there and over in Bristol and stuff. So when he uh, independently got in touch, it was just one of those things that you're like, uh, when you do what when you do what I do, it's it's quite exciting when you get to collaborate with someone that you already are aware of, and uh, yeah. then you know hopefully get to hear the kind of that being you know a pedal you you build getting used later on on a bit of music that you might purchase or whatever. So yeah, it's like exciting exciting stuff. But, you know, as you know, for me and him, Ross is a very friendly chap and uh, very easy to get along with. So, Definitely. Uh, yeah, we uh, spent quite well with Ross, yeah. Yeah, he was very generous with his time with me when uh, when I met up with him. He was doing a show in Edinburgh in the Fringe, and I was uh, repairing some a pedal that he had that he had some trouble with, sort of old electro harmonics thing from the 70s. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, we met up a couple of times, and, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, yeah. Oh, excellent. So what is your actual background in music, then? How did you get to... Well, actually, actually, let's not get how you get the pedals, but what is your background in music? Um, I guess, well, I, like a lot of people, I, uh, I have had a similar story, I think, uh, to a lot of the people that you've interviewed so far, in that, like, some sometime around my early teens, like, you know, you hear something, mm-hmm. and it, like, makes a switch for it in your head. And I think, I think for me, it was, like, the, the opening chords to Smells Like Teen Spirit. Like, just, um, just hearing that, and then the drums and then what happens afterwards I, I wore my tape out I, my mate had copied me like a few a few songs and before the end the start of that, of that song was so warped and jangled it was it was like it was coming underwater or something like that and so I immediately was like obsessed with trying to make that happen so yeah I got I remember I remember trying to play like uh, my dad had like an old nylon string acoustic guitar mm-hmm. and I knew that something was wrong because it was it was never going to sound the same and you know I was like 11 at the time or something like that and uh, you know my dad had like a his, my dad and his brother both used to play guitars my dad used to be a DJ and so he was quite sort of excited about me getting into music and quickly told me that I needed an electric guitar <laughs> and so when I kind of was still wanting it after a period of time that's when I first kind of got me me kind of Squire Stratocaster which Classic. I, yeah, yeah, got it, got it in red. Um, you know, at the, at the, at the sort how of red, insistence. How red's red? Very red. At the, <laughs> at the insistence of the guy in the shop, man. I mean, you know, I wanted a black one. You know, because it's like obviously, much, you know, a bit more of a kind of cool, cool yeah. image. But like, he was like, oh, you'll just see all your fingerprints. And I was, I don't know why, as an eleven-year-old, that made an impression on me. But like, uh, I definitely followed his advice. And uh, I can remember painting it all sorts of different colours afterwards because I, I, you know, I obviously like regretted the initial colour choice. But um, but it really, it really kind of blew my mind. You know, I was just like hacking away at this thing, trying to figure it out. I can yeah. remember like someone telling me. You know, another mate at school who had a guitar he was like, oh, it's bar chords is what you've got to learn. You've got to learn bar chords if you want to play rock music. And, uh, and I, just, I just assumed from reading that what, I, what various little information I could find, like, you know, this is, this is sort of mid, you know, early mid-90s. No internet or anything like that. Yeah. Just knew that you had to stick your finger across all the strings. Yeah. And so that's all I was doing, you know, just like literally all across the same fret. And that is a chord, but it's a horrible chord. Yes. It's like E11 or something it, like yeah. that. So that wasn't right. But that, you know, even just getting to that stage where I could play like a rudimentary version of what I thought to be Team like spirit, spirit yeah. using one finger and it sounding definitely bad, you know, was like, yeah, it's, it, started, it started something in me that never really went away. I, t- I totally know what you mean because when you first start learning, I'm sure people listening to this will probably hear themselves in it, but if you don't go through that bit where you sound rock yeah, yeah. and when you pick it up it, 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 that little spark that goes off in your fingers and you feel it working and 
It's, it is. It's something that it's hard to describe unless you've done it. So All those yeah. early days of like uh, of you know even playing an electric being like painful. You know having to Yo. get through the the sort of you know quite rudimentary calluses you have to yeah. build up to play the guitar. It's nothing compared to what some people do. You know with, on a daily basis using their hands, but like. Uh, you know, I remember it being a real a, a real barrier, and then you kind of wear that with pride, where you're like, you know, I can play an F now, like a, <laughs> like a proper F. A proper know. F, yeah. But it's a big deal, you know, gone are the days of, yeah, gone are the days of skipping past every song that had that chord in it, <laughs> just being like, no, I'm not doing that yet. Yeah, like, we'll come back to that got one. minor in it, I'll play that one. Yeah, yeah, all that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, were you in bands and stuff, or? Oh, yeah, I mean, so, like, a few, a few of my mates were all getting bang into music around the same sort of time and you know I was born in 81 and so you know we were quite sort of fortunate I think I mean everyone's got that scene they coincide with mm-hmm. but for us it was you know like the kind of early stages of grunge and then moving on to that you know from over in the states and various pretenders over here but then you know when Britpop and everything exploded and Oasis and Blur and stuff like it was just it just felt so doable you know in, in a similar way to like punk did I guess in the, mm-hmm. in the 70s yeah. like people were just getting up and doing it and so there were loads of bands around by me and quickly you know my mate and his brother started playing music together you know Pete used to play guitar and, and John was like a great like a very instinctively good drummer you know like mm-hmm. often the first people you end up forming bands with sometimes the drums can be the weak link because it's a hell of an instrument to learn yeah. and no one wants to do it no it's like being a goalkeeper in five or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just the, la- the last guy picked. <laughs> but uh, but John was great. And so, like, uh, you know, almost immediately we were just like, this is this is great fun. You know, like, we're having a, a hell of a time. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that was, you know, we were crazy young. Like, not like Hanson young, but mm-hmm. like, you know, we didn't have amps. So we were just plugging the guitar into, like, uh, you know, like my dad's separate system or whatever. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like, and it just sounds, you, it's funny you said about sounding dreadful I mean it really did it really does because a, a guitar pickup is not the correct impedance to be plugged into like a, no. a funno socket and so you get this kind of woolly horrible sort of sound out of it but it was louder than than we could shout and that was that was good enough you know so so it was good enough enough oh yeah and so we just had this whole whole kind of ramshackle series of jury rigged bits of equipment to make voices louder and, and, and make guitars sound louder and stuff and yeah, we that band continued until, you know, I went to university and stuff, and we still get together and play. Like elements of that band went on to, to be in to be part of the band that I was in in, in my twenties and stuff like that. And um, so yeah, I've constantly been playing in various different guises to you know no no degree of success other than just playing gigs, having a really great time, and uh, getting out there and kind of meeting other people that feel the same way. Really doing it, yeah. So when you say there was loads of bands around your way, what where is your way? So I grew up uh, around Reading, just outside okay. of London. There, yeah. so it's like it's one of these towns that I think I think people are people are flocking to live in Reading maybe now, but like uh, London is is sprawling so far that you know even thirty miles outside yeah. of it is kind of considered the same thing. But at the time, it's definitely not a great place to grow up. But you know, uh, it had the festival. You know, every yeah. every summer. So we immediately had like kind of ac- access to to some to watching great bands come through. You know, like Nirvana played there uh, twice, like in the early '90s, and you know there were like people like the Pumpkins and Hole coming across from the states. So every summer we'd all be at Reading. Um, so you know that was kind of like your your kind of yearly injection, I guess, of all the good stuff. But yeah. the rest of it we'd all, and we had like there was a, there was a scene. You know, like um, yeah. I can but imagine that, yeah. In terms of the bit, in terms of the bands that came out of my my peer group and, and people my age, like the Cooper Temple Claws were the main oh, ones right. that came out. They, those guys all went to my school, and um, yeah, they really um, made it through uh, properly. You know, made a few records and stuff. Yeah, and I got into them when I was at uni, probably the similar time. I was eight three, so similar time you were at uni. And I bought the album and liked it, but it wasn't until like, ten years later when I re re listened to it. I was like, yeah. this is I re refound it. I, I sometimes I think music finds you at the right age. They were like, uh, they were kind of really ahead of ahead of their time. I think in a lot of what they were doing, you know, they were they were doing quite sort of soundscapey, <laughs> mad, like multi instrumental things and and stuff. So like, uh, I think maybe the reason it didn't really 
kick on to like what you would call like major, you know, intercontinental success or whatever was just timing really but oh, timing yeah <laughs> and you know this is the thing like surely I mean everything started to fall apart in the in the kind of early 2000s didn't it with, with regards to like record labels and, and actual like you know bands having contracts where they could make money and stuff like that so yeah, um, yeah I think they were just kind of victims to that somewhat but um, yeah they were great and uh, yeah there were, there were bands coming out and there was enough there was enough of us that felt the same way to be out there playing gigs and stuff but um, <laughs> You know, to go and to go and get into the into the scene proper, you'd be you'd be going into London, you'd be getting the train and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. And did, was that something that you did, or was it? Is London? It's, it's it's saturated, isn't it? London can be some nights. It was one of those things that, like, at the time, we were still at the time where you could go to the you could go to Camden, and you you knew that you, from the enemy and the melody maker or whatever, you knew that there were a couple of pubs that a lot of the main the main guys like were drinking and stuff so there would be like little pilgrimages to like the Good Mixer and the Dublin Castle and stuff like that yeah so you'd be going to see maybe not you wouldn't be going to see like a a nascent like Libertines or whatever you'd be but you'd be seeing you'd be seeing something or other going on and so yeah we did we did go out there a lot and uh, and see and see music and you know that was it was it was the main place you went. I mean, you know, most people that live in Reading and around that area, like getting getting that train into town is is just part of growing up. You you get to the age where your parents let you do it, and that's kind of all you want to do, really. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I went to university down in Southampton, which is more of a kind, which had you know it, it's independent venues and yeah. you could see a lot of live music. And the uni actually, there was lots of good stuff on at the union when I was there. I was quite lucky to catch when it came through. So yeah, you know. You find it where you find it where you can, you know. I'm sure a lot of people maybe grow up in places where there isn't like a great scene that binds everyone together. But I think these days, more than anything, you can kind of can kind of make that yourself yeah. by finding these people. I think you can, yeah. I think Ross talks about that a lot about well, when they had people of similar um, similar mindsets, you know, the bunker and mm. all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I think you're right. These kind of pockets of. Um, Creativity, I guess you could call it. So there you are in your bands in Red. What was your first introduction to pedals? I know you said that when you were playing Smells Like Teen Spirits, it didn't sound yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Did you just go out and buy pedals, or did you borrow pedals, I, or I remember just take a punt? <laughs> well, I remember like I had a I had a I had a guitar teacher for a short while who was trying to teach me Gary Morlicks and all of that wasn't really wasn't really connecting with me and it was it was pretty it was pretty tough um, you know I'd, I'd be taking him songs I wanted to learn and it was very much like off piste from what he uh, what he was felt comfortable with but he did send me home with uh, my the, my first kind of interaction with the guitar effects pedal and it was like the Boss HM2 heavy metal pedal <laughs> which which is one of these pedals that does sound quite quite dreadful but actually has like a real kind of cult following now like a, okay. a band called Swerve Driver used them and they're, they're really big in like the sort of Swedish doom metal right, I know. scene yeah. so but at the time yeah. you know it was that thing it was like I know what I want to sound like you know I wanted to have that kind of that kind of big raucous whatever grunge kind of guitar sound and that wasn't it um, but it, it got it got me to realising that maybe that was that might be, you know that was what I needed to sort of do and so I had an amp and it, it, it was you know that was where I was getting my clean sound from but it, yeah so that's what I was kind of pursuing from an early point in time but back in the day you know you'd just be going you go to a record you go to a music store and yeah. you know they're they're quite kind of uh, intimidating atmosphere, environment sometimes but sometimes you can find a good one and there were a couple of nice ones in in Reading, actually, where the guys were quite like laid back and stuff, and about you trying things out, and so I think it was there that maybe I started thinking, you know, like what are these strange, these strange like coloured boxes and stuff, and like what are they all about? And um, I remember at the time mail order was that was how you got hold of them. Like if you wanted to get them cheap, you know, I remember that in the guitarist magazines, you know, they'd just be these printouts of uh, all the inventory and stuff. And Flying Pig Music Company, I remember that sticking in my head because you know you. would You'd be on the phone to them, you know, asking whether they had any like Boss DS ones or whatever, and they'd be like, "No, nah, no, nah, we're all sold out," and that would be it. You'd have to wait two weeks and call them up again to see when they were going to have them in again. So that that kind of kindled something in me, you know. But um, I'd always been kind of—I'm an engineer, so I'd always been kind of taking stuff apart and most, you know, initially breaking it, but mm-hmm. because I didn't know what I was doing. But 
trying to figure out how things work. So that first Fender, that first Squire Strat, like that, you know, I had that thing open. Like the first time I broke more than two strings on it, I think I had all the screws off and I was looking under the scratch plate because I wanted to know what the pickups were connected to and like what it was all about. And so it just kind of was like a natural progression from that, really. I think I remember my dad helping me because he could solder and stuff, so he taught me taught me all that. I needed to learn to solder because I ended up, you know, breaking breaking bits and bobs. Like stuff gets worn out when you use it all the time. And so when we were fixing the guitar, he showed me how to solder. And from that point onwards, I was like, right. So what's this? What's this pedal stuff all about? Like, can you make a pedal? Like, can I do it? And I remember we made a, we tried to make a fuzz pedal. We had a schematic, and it was all, you know, the kind of from the seventies, like almost like a RAF field manual, <laughs> manual terribly photocopied, and and we, you know, we must have put all the wrong parts in it or whatever because it didn't sound like, you know, like a, a Did nice you get a sound fuzzy jam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounded like, uh, you know, that kind of motorboating kind of sound that you get from a really poorly biased fuzz pedal, just almost like a, a, a thin, crackly version of your guitar. And you know, at the time, I was like, well, there you go. We've done that. I mean. I, ch- I took it to my bandmates, and they were like, "We'll just turn that off." Like, you know, like, <laughs> that's terrible. But, um, mm-hmm. but you know, that was the sort of start of it. But so, have re- you ever really bought many pedals? Or oh just, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, you know, I've. Um, I think, like a lot of people, you go through stages where um, you're kind of. So, I mean, pedals are an interesting topic, really. They're quite quite a sort of divisive subject. I think. I think a lot of people feel that they're like unnecessary distraction and. There are many amazing guitarists who have like a no frills approach to their to getting a sound or whatever, and you know lots of them like make fantastic music. You know, like the guys from the guy, you know, Malcolm Young recently died. Yes, and, like, yeah, you know, ACDC like revolutionised rock music using no pedals like throughout their entire career. I can't, I can't, ima- I can't think of an example when they use one. And you've got examples like when when you were talking to Ross he said the future heads had like a manifesto where they were yeah. like no pedals yeah and that you know that I think that comes from like a punk sensibility that a lot of people were just kind of like no fuss just just get 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 between a and b as soon as possible like uh, with, with as little distractions um and I think there's like totally this that's like totally valid approach and I I've, I've been there myself at times you know I've stripped it right back to nothing and it does make you think about the guitar in a different way to just be like I'll do what I can with like my, you know, whatever my amp can do and whatever I can do with my pickups and volume knob or whatever or just even the way you're playing the instrument of course but there's just something that's that's in a lot of us I think guitarists and other musicians where you you do want to explore like the kind mm-hmm. of the boundaries of what what you can sonically achieve with the instrument and in our lifetime you know that's exploded out of all recognizability you know when i was a kid when i was playing in bands like a distortion device maybe a chorus pedal to give you a bit of warbliness or whatever they were like your staples and then like if people had a bit of money they might have a delay pedal but no one knew what the hell they were or or much less how to use them in like a kind of reasonable music sense so so 19 minutes 30 seconds James would be listening to this going yep Ben bought that delay pedal digital delay and he messed around with it we've well, got a few like to my credit I so which, which one did you get was it like one of the boss um, ones boss it? digital delay the white one with the um, light blue writing oh yeah like those but, are classics man design yeah, well, classics I, I, I loved it and I, I, <laughs> did you I, love playing it on your own <laughs> and then you just weren't allowed to play it in the band well exactly yeah yeah but, I never big myself up from the band days, but we did get a few songs out of that pedal. Yeah, well, that's the thing. They can um, be like a, they can open you to new, new it, perspectives. It's just I had to rein myself in. Yeah, right? man, it's a toy, right? It, you know, it is. You it, just and once you've got it, you feel like oh, I could just put it on this song. Yeah, <laughs> just put it on this song. And like it, 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 it was probably two or three tracks we used it live. Yeah, which is out of a set of eight to ten songs. That's all right. Few. That's yeah. decent penetration. Exactly. <laughs> but when we were recording, I could play around with it a bit more and try and get. Um, I mean, I'm probably going to. I'm drifting a little bit here, but use that with um, what do we use it with? Something like a fuzz or a big muff or something like that, and get a really loud nonsensical yeah, sound cha- chaotic yeah. sort of thing but yeah. you put that I don't know like 
thirty percent of the sound in, in one of your tracks. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just it gives you a kind of a pad, you know, like a bed. Yeah. That, uh, I always find that digital delay or just delay itself makes it sound like you know how you're playing the guitar when I really didn't know. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, like I think a lot of people would. Say, I mean, it would be controversial maybe to a lot of people, but I think a lot. A lot I mean, Bill Bailey does this great thing, you know, the comedian where yeah, he yeah. does stuff with music and. Uh, He's playing like some U2 style guitar and it's like ping ponging around all over the place and, yes. uh, and it sounds very thick and ethereal and cathedral like and um, then he turns off the delay pedal and he's just he's just effectively sounds like he's like uh, impotently like picking a banjo <laughs> string or something exactly. and there's nothing actually happening yeah. there. So yeah, I mean some people have that school of thought that that's what the edge is actually doing underneath all of that <laughs> processing power but I don't think I'd want to poke that hornet's nest. No, no, God, no. And if, if Edge ever wants to come on, he's well more than welcome. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's, <laughs> he wouldn't want to close that. Though. No, definitely not. <laughs> um, so I think we're kind of touched on the next couple of questions I've got. So like, it's like why, why pedals then? Like what what if you had, if you had, I am now. Mm. Someone's saying, why did you choose pedals to explore further and for a living? Yeah, well, the, the I guess to. To answer the second question, I've got I got to answer the first one, which is that like you know, well, I think I got heavily into a couple of bands who really, who really do use pedals as a bit. So I, I mentioned like purists and stuff who don't use them, but equally there's some there's some very inspiring examples of, of people who who use pedals and, and other effects as like their an integral part of their sound. So you know, yeah. like by that I mean like Radiohead, um, you know, mm. like almost all the guitarists in that band use like pedals a lot. So Ed O'Brien, Johnny Greenwood and Tom York, um, Russell Lissack of Block Party. Also. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's like, actually, it's funny you mentioned Rush, um, Russell and Block Party. That's one of the bands that were... That, that was the delay delay pedal yeah, exactly. sort of inspiration. I wanted, to, I wanted to sound like Block Party. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just Block Party, but like that was the band I listened to right when we were in our infancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Silent Alarm was Silent Alarm. And yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I basically wanted to write. Um, what's the first track? Eating Glass. Right? Yeah, yeah. Eating Glass. Yeah. It's a head turner. It's one of those things that you you hear you hear that for the first time, and it, you know it's got elements of stuff that's come before. You know, like some, it sounds a bit. Some some of their stuff sounds a little bit like Gang of Four or MC Five or or like uh, or Wire, but like. But what's really all happening at the same time in that is is kind of uniquely them, and um, I think a lot of that has got to do with the way they use stuff like effects pedals. And yeah, one of the, I think actually one of the one of the coolest things they do is to consider the the two guitars that they have as like different tools to like play the same piece of mm -hmm. music. Effectively, you, you know, like yeah. where they divide the notes that are being played between the two of them, and you get this kind of really interesting. Um, like a kind of panning effect because stuff's flying around from one of them to the other. But yeah, so people like him and Tom Morello oh, from Reggie's well, yeah. Machine. Um, so these guys, you know, like um, you get super into them, uh, listening to them, and and, it, and a lot of us want to kind of try and figure out what's going on and, and, and recreate those sounds, even if you're just um, if you're just wanting to kind of muck around at home or cover their songs, or you might want to build the same sort of ideas into yours. So. That that was kind of what bit, bit me in like a big way. So um, yeah, when I was playing in the bands, I, I was I was like the one with the effects pedals, you know, like uh, and you know the board threw and shrank or whatever. Yeah, I had my moments where I was over the top with it, and they're causing like you know mid gig disasters where I tread on the wrong thing or. I had this. I, yeah, I had this in thing. Tuna or uh, I had this terrible experience with this the DD twenty, which is like a boss. It's like a dual delay pedal, and sometimes they build these things into them, and you never understand why it's there. And in this case, they had this they had a sound in there, and I, I can't remember the name of it. It was called Ramp or something like that. But when you held the pedal, it just ascended the note kind of that you were playing like up and up and up, and it got louder and louder and louder, mm -hmm. and then it like dipped down again. And it was so it was almost like riding on a sort of circus carousel or something like that. It was like so loud. Yeah. And once you'd started the process from happening, once you'd started the the sound <laughs> going, that was it. It yeah. was go it was gonna happen. And it happened when I was meant to be. I thought I had it on a different mode where it would just provide a very nice ambient swell just in the background. So that's the kind of thing I was going for in a very quiet song with some arpeggio and stuff. And now I am pushing the pedal down, expecting that to happen, and yeah, I just kind of launched this horrendous, you know, clown music behind me, and everyone in the band was just looking at me like, what have you done? And yeah. 
Like, oh, that, to, to be fair, the audience were just swiftly po-faced about it. They were just like, well, maybe that's what he's going for. I mean, <laughs> it was not what I was going for. So, yeah, they can cause problems. Mm-hmm. But I had a great time mucking around with them. And in terms of how I got into it, like, um, building them. So, I... Around kind of, you know, the mid-2000s, you know, when the, when the internet started to kind of really take on a meaning for, or, you know, use kind of for guitarists in a lot of ways, you know, like the precursor to all this. Um, so social media now was like the, the rise of discussion forums and stuff like that. So yeah. there was um, there was one in particular which was like um, dedicated to like oddball Fender guitars, like short scale Fender guitars, like, you know, the Mustang and the Jaguar mm-hmm. and stuff like that, which, yeah, like that, which now are like really, really popular again. Yeah. But at the time... They weren't at all. Like uh, you, you could only really get hold of these reissues from Japan, and they were. Um, they at one point they they were only made in Japan, and you had to get them imported. You had to go onto this yeah. like Japanese website, and it was all and you know there's no Google Translate, so you're effectively just like giving them your credit card details over like, email, and you're just like, please send me a Mustang type thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, because I really wanted a Jaguar. Oh, yeah. Because I'm left-handed. The person in the shop went... No, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you're not going to get one built. And if you do, you can't afford it. Yeah, whereas nowadays, you're in luck, yeah, right? Of course, you yeah, know, Which is great. Absolutely. I mean, so th- that's one of the things that's, that's been great about, like, I think, the internet and stuff, is that, like, now, people like Fender, I mean, you know, they pay attention to stuff like that. They, mm-hmm. they know... The, they know the kind of instruments that we can't buy anymore that we're enthusiastic about buying and I'm sure you know from a cynical perspective as far as they're concerned they're like these guys want to buy instruments from us so let's make some money but like uh, but for everyone else like it gives you access like we didn't have it before you know so from from talking to these guys about that um, I made a lot of friends uh, you know here in the UK and like all over the world and when it came to me starting my own little uh, foray into making pedals once I was at university and I was studying electronics there they, they were like my initial kind of people that were interested in me doing that so you know I, that made by Mike as the name for my company comes not because you know I'm I mean that is not an amazingly unique like name to come <laughs> up with but it was uh, it was literally just came out of the fact that you know I was equally uninspired with my name on that forum I was just Mike and then um, <laughs> when it came to you know pedals it was like oh I got that made by Mike type thing so people were just you know I was just building initially just very simple volume boost pedals that yeah. you can use in a variety of different ways to like just make your clean sound louder if you're doing a bit of if you want to stick out above everyone else or like to to push the, your amp harder to make it overdrive that way or in front of other pedals so like that was my first kind of foray just very simple just make the signal louder pedals but you know as with a lot of things start small like um mm-hmm. and then just go with it from there so i ended up at the time, so this is all this is all kind of you know mid two thousands, late two thousands now, and okay. I was making demos on YouTube at the time. That was another thing that was kind of cropping up out of like everyone's everyone kind of having access to the internet and um, chatting about stuff. So there's this huge kind of discourse going on about pedals, and everyone's like wanting to buy them, and everyone can suddenly get online and. Mm-hmm. You know, get hold of this stuff, which is maybe vintage. Like stuff's coming up on eBay, right? Like you know, old fuzz pedals or old delay pedals and tape echoes. And everyone's like, I, you know, I want, I, I want that thing because you know this guy played it on that record, and I'd love to make that sound. But what does it really sound like? And so you get this kind of series of videos that people start making where they just they've got this they've got this gear and they just kind of uh, lots of them are just in their bedroom and they've got like a recording set up. Um, for making demos for bands and stuff and they just start recording demos of, of video of, of mm-hmm. guitars and uh, pedals and, and amplifiers and stuff so I kind of got quite into that and that was kind of where I think a lot of people found me you know when I was building pedals because so I would demo pedals I built myself as well I'd be like oh you know I built this green muff green green uh, electro harmonics big muff pedal that which you now now is like reissued widely but at the time it was a bit of an oddity and you know the circuit diagram was out there so I was like I'll build that see what it sounds like okay. and then I was just we'd like make a demo of it and that was kind of how it kind of carried on and that's I think still how some people find me because they find my videos and stuff online and they're like oh there's the guy that his, his weight has oscillated in years and uh, he's got various facial hair <laughs> stages <laughs> in his life and he can't really play the instrument but but yeah that was kind of that was kind of how I got myself out there and um, so it was a nice kind of thing it was quite an organic experience being okay. in touch with customers well customers like I don't really like to call them that I just 
let's call them like other guitarists or whatever, like people, fellow enthusiasts. Yeah, yeah, you know, people that that want to make music and stuff. And I, the thing I, the thing I'm not doing is trying to like, you know, make a lot of money. You know, I don't, I don't price my pedals very high. I don't make large runs of mm-hmm. of designs, and I, I don't have any relationships with any shops or anything like that. I'm just like a cottage industry, just like one guy building pedals in my spare time and um, and you know dealing with people on a one by one basis so when you when you buy one of my pedals if you're not buying it second hand like you know I'm the person who's who you're emailing about it and discussing like what you might want to have and, and stuff like that but yeah it was a bit of a breeding ground that, that forum you know I don't know whether you've heard of uh, Dwarf Craft Devices from over in Eau Claire Wisconsin no, no. and well they do they do amazing stuff like really on the wild end of, of FX pedals um, and they have a, they have fantastic like you know, roster of people that use their pedals. You know, like Boniver and Nine right. Inch, uh, My Bloody Valentine, uh, Nine Inch Nails, people like that. And um, right. and over here in in the UK, there's a guy called Tim from the same forum who started Frederick FX, and they're down in in London. And they again have made pedals for people like Future, of the Left, and um, My Bloody Valentine again. I mean, that guy they, they like pedals, so. <laughs> They're customers of a lot of people, uh, but yeah, so it's a funny thing. It's like a sort of there's like another community of yeah. like builders and stuff that's kind of sprung up. That's cool. So if I was, let's say, I don't know, ten years ago, twelve years ago, thinking about getting pedals, how would I don't obviously sell them? But what would you say? What can they do? Why would you use a pedal? How would you? How would you sell a pedal? Not sell. Sell yeah, the what's, the, what's the idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, idea like, of pedals. Well, I guess the first thing to say is like everyone should really own a tuner pedal, or at least, <laughs> yeah, or at least one of those debris that like clicks onto your headstock and stuff. Because uh, one of the main like mis- problems people have when they're playing live is you know falling out of tune is no good. So solve that one straight away. Get a pedal, get a pedal tuner right in front of you. But I just say that like uh, in terms of what they can do and what they offer you, um, it's the ability to do something different with your sound like immediately during a live performance which can add interest so you know if you're in if you're in like a kind of acoustic situation like you may not find yourself immediately drawn to them but um there's still a lot actually that can be done with you know most electric most acoustic guitars that you're going to use in a live performance will be put into a PA Mm -hmm. and you may well want to use something like a compressor which can um which can even out the uh, the volume differences that are introduced when you're finger picking and strumming the instrument, such that you're always like providing a nice like thick sound to your to your audience, no matter what you're doing. And uh, and you know a lot of people also like to use a bit of reverb um, when they're doing acoustic stuff, but um, to provide like ambience and stuff. I'll stop you there. Thirty four thirty. <laughs> the person that we used to do recording with, Kev, who will listen to this, he loved reverb. It can, it can be a killer, man. And he's, he's not a guitarist. He's, he's I would say if anything. He was all Brian Eno. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he put, you know likes you know likes ambience. He did, and he put re- Kev put. Re- Kev, if you're listening, you put re- reverb on everything. And to be honest, it, once, you, but once you hear like what he did with it, you can you get it. I think that it, I think it's it's a useful thing. You you kind of almost you've almost got to do it if you're not recording in a room or playing in a room, which is doing that for you in terms of like you know the if if the room is quite a lively room and you get that sort of like bleeding of sounds into one another and stuff then you might not need to do it but if you're playing in like a dead space like you know most people's bedrooms are not (laughs) going to provide that kind of that sound so I think you have to you have to kind of apply a little bit I'd say and it can be overused but then again overuse is just like that's a that's a perception thing you know and it's a personal personal choice like you know abusing these things is is often what yields the most interesting sounds Mm. and stuff so that guitar riff you've just heard there James was a nice um, distortion pedal with overdrive right yeah just on that little riff that we have there good it it is good well well, no doubt (laughs) I I do quite like various pedals (laughs) yeah Uh uh-huh so yeah, I was going to say the fun. The first things was like getting to know Mike a bit and about his background and that. And one of the main things I liked about the whole interview was that he was in a band, did this, did that, did the other, but still continued his passion in music, just in a different way with pedals. I think that's yeah. cool. That's similar to what we're doing here, like our passion in music when we're in the band and we've 
channeled that into the podcast. It's similar to my just a different part of yeah. well, he, his journey seemed so similar to <laughs> when he was. To, and that's what I liked about you. Someone who was passionate about music started in that DIY nature, like a lot of us did. Uh, I, I loved the the bit where he was talking about first learning the guitar, and you know, you'd skip any songs that happened to had an F chord in it because yes. it was too hard to do when you and that's that's a thing so yeah, yeah definitely a lot of songs have an F in it though or like a, a, a bar chord or power chord depending on how you how you take. power yeah but, uh, uh, to me mm. they're bar chord bar chords yeah I hated them when I was learning well that's the point <laughs> yeah I, they do hate them but once you get used to them you can get a lot out of them but we're not here to talk about F's F, <laughs> F chords on the, the topic <laughs> Or any chord in a bar formation. But yeah, then uh, sort of forming on from that when he started to go down the like pedals as the thing for me, it seemed mm-hmm. like it's burned from a, a community sort of, well, an online sort of mm-hmm. forum yeah. where there was lots of people similar to him who were just interested in pulling things apart, taking yeah. one of these pedals, ripping the, the cover off them, seeing how it all works. I would never have done that. They're so expensive, the ones I had. <laughs> Bonus time! Let's buy a digital delay. £90. Let's take it apart. No. <laughs> Let's leave it in the box where it's nice and new. I didn't leave it in the box, just for anyone knows, and James will testify to that. Yeah, definitely. But, but, yeah, sorry, it, it, but, but you're right. I think I've always There's a lot of investigation you was talking about, like how like the guitar itself works. Well, with you the get pickups. old ones, don't you? I mean, to to yeah, pull yeah. apart. I mean, I'd, again, I would never have done that with pedals, but like computers, for example, you know, mm-hmm. I'd happily pull an old one apart when I was younger to figure out how it worked and how it could pull it back together. And the first time I did that with an old one, well, yeah, struggled like hell to put it back together again. But mm-hmm. then you learn and you get better at it. And yeah, it's. Stands to reason, pedals is another thing that you can logically do that with. And I can see the the, the, the reason behind it. If you're in a band, let's just say from the early seventies or late sixties, and they had a particular sound, a particular guitar riff or bass, like a drowniness on the bass, how do you replicate that? There's nothing on the market. You ask the specialists in the shop because they'll well, well they'll want to sell you one, whether it's what you want or not. Well, that's a bit unfair. But um, well, it depends on the shop. Depends on the yeah, it does. Not in my experience, I must admit. But if, I mean, they must the unscrupulous sort of music shop mm-hmm. um, owner. You could just imagine how clueless some people mm-hmm. like you would have been coming coming along with their money. Right, I want this pedal. Yeah, because essentially, I guess a lot of people are. I want a pedal because I want to sound awesome. I want to sound louder. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. well, I was quite lucky. Um, so, well, what does that mean? What you... <laughs> because I never had pedals when I was younger, but when I started on the guitar, Michael got back into the guitar, and because he had a job, because he was an adult, <laughs> he bought uh, it was a Zoom but box. You said, I yeah, know. so I just stole that from him. It was it was not so technically stealing, but I stole that from him and just went, "Wait, what's this one? Flange? Oh, that sounds good. Let's write a song in that." Didn't work. What's this one? Overdrive. Oh, that's better. It's beefy. It's loud. Mm-hmm. Then you would get on to some ones and other ones and go, that's not for me. But then it's hard to use that live because you can't really change <laughs> yes. to another pedal. You can't really... Like, yeah, it had 99 limitations. sentences, but <laughs> multifunctionality <laughs> was not one of <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it, it, but it did serve the purpose of finding out what kind of thing you want. And if you, if you strip away 75 of them, 80 of them, you don't... like A lot of them are similar. You, I didn't need them because they weren't what I was looking for. So then when I went back into the guitar shop and I did have a, a job of my own, I could say, this is what the sound I'm looking for. I think I want a chorus pedal. That's what I originally went in for. And he said, do you want to sound like an 80s rock band? I went, no, man. well, that's what you're going to get. I said, what do you want to sound? He said, what do you want to sound like? I so why did you get to the point of having used, was it chorus on that Zoom box? I, I'm, it must have been. Or it was in my head somewhere that this is the pedal that I need to make my sound beefier. Mm, so you'd made a noise on this Zoom box and yeah. thought, that's what I want. Yeah, and technically but, the chorus pedal would have done that for us. But it's not what I would have wanted because he said, you really, for the, what you're looking at, you're looking at your indie rock alternative. You want an overdrive or even a distortion. So I went with the distortion originally because it was the cheapest pedal. I had an offer £39. <laughs> And it was good and did do everything I wanted, but you lost a lot of the tone on it because it's louder and it's fuzzier. And it, mm. I like it for some songs, but if you want to get a bit of melody out of it, you need to get something a bit neater. Mm. 
Yeah, I remember. And that's when the on... overdrive came in. The, the the yellow pedal. That was the orange pedal. This is the yellow one. Right. You used that orange one all the time. That that's how I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I used the the overdrive. Dist- well, the overdrive was an overdrive distortion one, so it had kind of a combi on it, and that one was better for some of our songs. A lot of the songs, it was had a more of a indie punk feel to it, mm-hmm. so I used that more. But I did like to use the orange one live because it was just loud. Yeah. But like I say, you lose a you little just bit. Trying to drown me out a little bit, and Rob when he drops sticks and stuff like that. But never Simon. There's the Simon Weekly mention that he likes. Yeah, so anyway, getting back to the conversation that we had. So, like, a lot of investigating that he had, and I think it kind of matches what I did, but he went to the extreme a bit more, as in, how can I build these? How can I get these unique sounds? How can I get these sounds that have been lost? And I just investigated, so I didn't waste my money. Um, yeah, well, he went to the point, which, again, you'll have got to a little bit later on. Certainly, initially, Mike was at the point of, right, well, if I'm going to use a particular pedal on mm-hmm. a particular song. I'm going to do that because I'm actually going to know why. So what does reverb actually do, yeah. technically? What does it do to the, the, the sound? sound. Yeah. Um, and why would that be a good or a bad thing? Um, and knowing some of the science behind it can help inform mm-hmm. why the hell you'd go about doing that. I mean, he gave quite a far better explanation of reverb and why you'd actually want to to do it um, and sort of how you'd go about filling a space and, mm-hmm. and, and all that sort of stuff and and again I, uh, eventually once we'd spoken to more people and got a better understanding and then you start to sort of pick up on some of the logic behind right it's not just something that cool makes sound, something yeah. louder for example there's mm-hmm. all these other reasons why mm-hmm. you'd potentially apply an effect of some kind to mm-hmm. to a guitar sound and I think it's probably took us a while to get to the point of putting any sort of science that went beyond, oh, well, that changes it a bit, or that <laughs> makes it louder. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because for the first, like, well, if you year get it, or two, it was probably a lot of... Yeah, <laughs> and if you don't set it right itself, it can sound strange, because obviously, you're kind of like, you're playing, then all of a sudden it goes, it kind of almost stops and goes on a different sound. And it's, it's like, that that doesn't... Right. You've got that wrong, but if you have, like, if you get your, your, your settings right, it kind of blends into the song more rather than just a harsh... Now yeah. loud. <laughs> now fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I didn't really use that many pedals in the end. As I said, I had the distortion and the overdrive and the delay. Once I started using that properly, because I used to have it on quite high settings, and it was just it was just too much. Whereas it was Dave Curl, when we recorded, he turned it right down and said, that's what you're trying to do. You just don't know that you're trying to do that. I had a, had a tremolo. Yeah. And well, that's, that's a good example there. When you first... You know, start using these things. Speak to someone who's actually used I would use those types of yeah. pedals before and say, "Right, that sound I've just made is too whatever. Yeah. I want it to be more like a different type of sound and get someone to help you understand. Mm-hmm. Right, there's typically some knobs on these pedals. Yeah. What the hell do they actually mean? And what do they do? <laughs> the knob control <laughs> them as well. <laughs> well that's it. Yeah. Yes, they can be a key knob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in all of that so but yeah, yeah. I would say that um, just try them in the shop because potentially I could have got that pedal it was £90 I don't know how much they are now but that could have been completely wasted fortunately I persevered with it and like I say in the interview we got a couple of songs out of it and that is probably worth it in the end because you don't write a couple of songs yeah. and play them twice well, and play and them. also in, in part two we'll get on to some other good ways um, mm-hmm. of Potentially going about trying some sounds before you buy, which will not spoil, no. Exactly, yeah. But one of the main things I just want to point out, again, like what Ross said, which is a nice little correlation, he tried it at the start and some of it went wrong. And he built one and his mates in the band said, that's not the sound we want. So he went back to the drawing board, allowing yourself to fail. Did Ross build one? No, no, but Ross mentioned about allowing yourself to fail in a band that generally you make mistakes. Mm. It's, a, it's a similar correlation. Yeah, well, yeah, you're not going to build a good pedal the first and time. if you do, nice, but you're not going to, so it's fine. <laughs> Un- unlikely, yeah. yeah. Cool, so um, part two next week, getting a bit more detail, we'll cover the second part of the conversation, we'll get into a bit more detail about like different bands and different sounds. I don't want a bloody nuts and bolts conversation again. There's no nuts or bolts. Well, there might have been I any. I bet there is. I bet there is, actually. <laughs> and obviously we'll have the charity of that that week as well. 
Yeah, so it's a longer interview, I guess, this week. So we'll keep our spiel to a, a, a minimum-ish, because we want to keep the uh, episodes part of me wanted to keep all the episodes under an hour, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So we will catch you next week. Catch you next week. So coming up next week, we have part two with Mike, where we get on a pedal combinations, software emulation, and multi-effects boxes. We've reached the end of this week's episode of Anyone Can Play Guitar podcast. Big thank you for tuning in, and remember to stop by iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from, and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. While you're there, it would be amazing if you could leave a rating and a review. All the show notes can be found at www.acpgmusic.com And if you want to get in touch, email us your questions, any feedback and any suggestions to info at acpgmusic.com That's it for now. Keep supporting upcoming artists. And we'll catch you next time.